It's uh, one of the two events that will host this week on this topic. Uh, tomorrow, we we'll have also an event uh, that uh, will address more uh, uh, reasons for my, uh, that you observe the card, uh, current trends and competition policy applications. Today, as I understand, some of the speakers will also refer all the reasons behind markups, and they are very welcome to do that. And some of them are also particularly the lovers of competition policy, so they can feel free, uh, they should feel free to make some comments of this direction. Uh, but uh, the first question we'll address is what are the empirical trends? What do you observe in markets? Uh, and then what are the implications? And I'm very happy to have uh, a great uh, panel with me. Um, we will stand, uh, we'll start with a presentation by Jan de Locker from Catholic University of uh, Leuven, uh, who will present uh, his uh, ongoing uh, co-author research, who has uh, been very uh, influentially discussed all over the world. Um, and then we'll have a panel discussion. And uh, in alphabetical order, we have uh, Chiara uh, Criscuolo, the head of division of productivity and business dynamics in OECD. Uh, who runs uh, her own uh, research with uh, her team there, and we are uh, very interested in uh, hearing her views and uh, numbers on these issues. Um, we have uh, Fabienne curto who just arrived from uh, Silicon Valley to be with us. Uh, so, no any uh, jet lag so far. We... <laughs> uh, he's the director of uh, economic research at Google. Uh, then we have uh, Jeffrey Franks, Director of IMF uh, Europe Office, who is based here in Brussels. Welcome. And um, Rangilda Weigeler, our Senior Fellow, expert on this topic here at uh, our house. Uh, because we have many speakers, we don't have so much time, so Jan, directly the floor is yours. All right. All right, thank you for having me. Um, let me dive right into it. Um, I'm sure unless you, you've been living under a rock the last year, you, you probably have heard uh, the discussion. And what I'm going to do here today in the 25 minutes that I have is um, kind of bring you up to speed on some what are the major uh, facts. Uh, this research started with a U.S. focus, as is very often in economics. So it's both because of substantive interest but because of data. Um, and I'm also going to discuss some more recent findings for other parts of the, of the world. Uh, and then dive into kind of what we can make uh, out of these facts and then kind of conclude, which I'm sure we'll, we'll do more of it during the debate on, you know, what everybody wants to know. Like, sure, I've seen your facts, but what was the source behind it and what should we do, if anything? Okay, that's kind of like the roadmap. Um, if you talk to any economist and you ask them about market power, um, we kind of know what that means. It's sort of a departure from the canonical benchmark of perfect competition, which just means a producer should just charge you the marginal cost of producing that unit of an output. And we know if that prevails, that markets work efficiently and we get all the good stuff, right? If there's a wedge between the price and the marginal cost of production, the textbook will actually tell you the firm has market power. And lots of economists, um, when not put in front of a court, when they have to testify, will agree with the statement that if there's a wedge between a price and a cost of production, a firm has market power. Once there are real issues at stake, of course, you can, you know, we'll have a debate about whether these markups are actually a bad or a good thing, because we want innovation, we want firms to be able to cover their fixed cost, and there might be dynamic practices that over time, the firm is reinvesting uh, these proceeds, which actually make uh, consumers better off in the future. Okay, so these are some of the topics that go into this whole debate, and it's kind of clear that markups is a central measure uh, for any economist. This is one of the few occasions where economists agree, whether you're a macroeconomist, a development economist, an IO economist, uh, that a markup is a very important variable, but the link from a markup to market power is, of course, a much more contentious one, and I will uh, discuss that as well. Okay, and... The topic of conversation, and this is kind of for an academic, it's quite unusual, goes well beyond the realm of our, of our departments where we meet and talk to each other. This has been sort of a front and center at any major policy event where both people from the corporate world, policy and academic circles meet to essentially discuss this sort of, you know, has market power been on the up? And, and, and if so, what does it mean? And, and, and you know, what can we learn from it? Um, 
you know, last year, Jackson Hole, Sintra, you can keep going on. There was like lots of debates about do we live in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in an economy where increasingly um, concentration of, uh, of economic activity is taking place, which, which we mean that within each sector of the economy, a handful of firms are grabbing much more of, of market share, right? That's sort of a, 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 the, 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 the simple uh, uh, debate that was out there, okay? This is, you know, even if we're going to measure this, and there's going to be tons of issues, the reason that there's been such a debate around it is the potential implications, if it is true, and if it keeps on uh, persisting, is large for labor market outcomes, right? There's a connection to the falling labor share. There's a connection to um, sort of stagnating real wages for median households in the U.S. in particular. Um, it can stifle innovation and growth. It can have implications for income inequality and ultimately wealth inequality, right? So the potential implications, if these facts, you know, uh, suggest that there has been an increase in concentration in markets, are, are quite large. So it's only natural that we have all of these debates going on, uh, be uh, uh, among policymakers or, or academics, okay? Uh, so what I'm going to do today is give you a quick primer on what goes into the methodology, and it's always been my, and, and so for those of you who have seen me present this before, you can never explain a technical paper in two minutes, so you should never try it, so you should read the paper if you're interested. I'm going to give you just the one, you know, slide on intuition, what type of data you need, and how you measure it, just to give you a feel for how this uh, approach works, and I'm just going to give you a bunch of figures on what I've, uh, you know, of what Jan Eckhout and I, which is me and my co-author on this, on this uh, set of papers, have learned from this type of analysis, okay? And then we'll dive into implications and potential drivers, okay? So the standard type of data that you would need here, and this is going to be really important, is to see firm level data. So one of the things we've learned from this research is that firms are different, that may not strike you as kind of a big deal, but it just means that using aggregate industry level data, let's say total output for the steel industry or total value added for chemicals is just not gonna help you to identify whether concentration or market power has been on the rise. In particular, since we know that the action is coming from the top firms. So the aggregate is gonna mask all the heterogeneity. So we want firm level data and there our hands are tied with data availability, okay? So some of my work has used only listed firms. So for the US, this is a, a well-known CompuStat firm uh, data. And for the rest of the world, we've used the analog, which is called WorldScope. But, you know, you know, due diligence requires you to do more than just the listed firms. It's clearly a selected sample. So all what I'm going to tell you today for the US, we've actually found the same results when you look at all private firms in the US, so 7 million plus firms uh, in the US economy. And Jan and I are actually rolling out this program of measuring markups and market power to other countries in the world where we can grab this sort of population of firms, okay? Um, economists make a big deal out of the fact that uh, we cannot really trust accounting data because firms uh, do not report cost in the way that economists do. And the, the most obvious thing we think about is sort of the cost of capital and how do you measure that? Because we think as economists that there's an opportunity cost. If you invest into a machine or into a plant, you're foregoing interest rate of that amount that you could have been putting on, on a bank, or these days, it's not clear what that's gonna give you. Um, so that's kind of a, a crucial problem that we face, right? So the ability to measure the profitability of a firm, which we are gonna measure as the wedge between the price and the marginal cost is what we call the markup, um, is a difficult thing, right? And there's a whole long literature that talks about how to do this. What we're gonna use in this, in this line of work is a departure from what IO and competition policy economists are now very used to. When competition policy economists come together and they have to simulate the effects of a merger, they put two firms together and they let the model tell them what the post-merger price will be. And then the commission or whoever, the OJ, the FTC can decide, we think the price is too high, we're not gonna allow the merger. So it's a model-based simulation. So you have to specify how firms compete, how consumers value the products, the whole system. The approach that I've been pushing for does not have all these features. It's much more minimalistic, but it doesn't have the ability to simulate forward. It, neither is it intended to do so. 
what it's going to do is measure the markups inside the sample, and the, the intuition can come from comparing two simple ratios. Any firm-level data set will give you information on, say, the wage bill of a firm, right? This is how much they pay their workers, divided by sales. On average, in the data in manufacturing, this number is about 0.25. This means that wage bill is about 25% in total sales. If you were to see, and this is a big if, the same wage bill, but not over total sales, but over total cost, right? Then if these two things were equal, we would conclude that the firm price is actually equal to the unit cost of production, and mathematically, this would give you a markup of one. That's the kind of perfect competitive benchmark. So the only thing you're left to do is actually compare this wage bill in the data over sales to what economists call this cost share. And this cost share is something, you know, because of the accounting data we get that we cannot readily observe. This is the thing we're going to have to estimate, and that's how economists get by this, by estimating production functions. So this whole methodology will actually deliver you, whenever economists use Greek symbols, it's the thing we care about, but it's the thing we don't see in the data. So the markup symbol in this literature is mu, okay? And so mu IT is just going to be each firm in my data, right? It's going to be InBef, it's going to be in 1995, it's going to get a measure of price over marginal cost. Okay? Now, of course, when you want to talk to macroeconomists, you cannot give them thousands of numbers over many years, right? So we're going to have to summarize this somehow for a region time period. And the way you do this is by aggregating, and this is going to be important, aggregating over all the firms. And the beauty here is you can do this however you think you would like to do it. You can do it over regions, you can do it over, uh, within a country, you can do blocks of country, right? So what I'm going to show you here, most of the figures are going to be an aggregate markup number per year in, say, the United States, and later on I can show it to you for any country or region in the world you're interested in. The importance here is, I'm going to, important thing is I'm going to have the markup here per firm, but I'm going to weigh the firm by its importance in total sales in the economy. I remember my comment that if there's firm heterogeneity and if the top firms are really grabbing more of market share, what can happen is even every firm in the economy can remain with the same market that it had in 1980, but if the only thing that happened in the economy is market share shifting to the high markup firm, this M here would go up, right? And I'm going to come back to this, this, this process which economists call reallocation, just the shifting of market shares away from one firm to the other firm versus just firms increasing their pricing power, okay? So these are the figures uh, for the United States that you may have seen. Jan and I have been playing around with two kinds of uh, production models. Essentially, they both give qualitatively the same results. 1980 to 2000s, we've seen a massive uh, increase in the ability of firms to raise price over marginal cost. Now, for the macroeconomists in the room, the first reaction you should have, which is not the right reaction, is how can this be because there's been no inflation? Remember, a markup is a ratio of price to marginal cost. If I'm telling you the market is going up, I'm not telling you prices are going up. What's actually coming out of this is the marginal cost of production are going down, and prices are not going down by as much, which means that the firm's variable profit margins are up, and they're pocketing some of the cost savings. Or, as we'll get into later on, it might be to offset the increase in fixed costs, which, which it is what we're going to find, right? And that has to do with... Uh, moving towards more fixed cost industries and production technologies, okay? So first fact from the U.S., up to a 30 or 40 percentage point increase in variable profit margins from 1980 up to recent periods. Okay, what's really important here, and, and, and this thing, you know, if there's one thing you go home with today, is that the median firm in the economy, which means 50% of sales and below, has not had an increase. So the panel on the left shows you that if you take the median firm, essentially markups have not been increasing. So this previous figure that I gave you is completely driven by the upper percentiles of the market distribution, which is to say within each sector, the increase is really coming from the top firms uh, either increasing their markup or increasingly grabbing market share. These are the two potential drivers behind this rise, and later on I will decompose them. In fact, I brought the decomposition with me today 
for the US, the red figure is again the, uh, the data that I've shown you. This is the increase in markups from 1980 to 2016. And what this figure tells you is that both the mere increase of markups within the firm, so you know, take any firm that you're interested in, look at two years, they could just have increased their markup. That's one reason behind this increase. That is the blue line. So the blue line tells you there has been a component of the market increase coming merely from the ability of firms to increase their markups over time. But a large component, and the fact that the blue line is strictly below the red line, tells you that this reallocation process, the moving of market share towards the high market firm, has been a very important driver behind this result. And if we want to look at sources behind these patterns, this is crucial, right? It tells us there's some market-based allocation that's taking place that's moving resources towards the high markup firm. And remember, I have not used the word welfare. I just use it in the sentence, but not before. And I'm doing that on purpose because this might still be a good thing. This might just be that we're getting resources deployed by more productive firms or just high fixed cost firms. Right? We haven't said anything about whether this is distortionary or has any implications that you know, we should you know, feel, feel um, we should do something about it. Okay? So that's crucial. So now we go to market power. Of course, how do you measure market power? You know, there's many ways you can do it. The only way that we saw fit in this analysis is to look at the profit rates. And you know, again, anybody who owns stocks uh, knows that things have been going pretty well, unless I guess a couple of months. But you know, over that same period, 1980 to 2016, the U.S. saw an increase in corporate profit rates from about nearly zero to about eight percentage points, and that's a massive increase, right? And if you overlay the markups, you essentially find that the firms in our data that have high margins are also the firms that are reporting high profits, and that's telling you what's going on, right? Markets have increased by 40 percent, profits have increased by eight percent. The reason that markups and profits are not the same is because Markups measure variable profit rates, okay? If there were no fixed costs, then both should be identical. So what do we find? Yes, there's been an increase in fixed costs, right? Or intangibles, and we can have a, 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 a discussion about it later on. But the return on these increased fixed costs has materialized in higher corporate profits, okay? And we find actually in the data a very strong relationship at the firm level between those firms who are spending more on marketing, advertising, R&D, brand value, CEO compensation, all things we, we don't think goes into the variable cost of production. Those are the ones whose markups have been increasing the most. Right? And we find that that elasticity has gotten stronger. So your intuition should be these results are sort of consistent with a Sutton-like and Dodge's sunk cost model, which means firms are engaging in more investments, right? But because of these investments, they're able to, you know, have, for some reason they've been able to take over the market. Now they have this big market size over which they can spread their fixed costs and their variable profits are higher to fund these fixed costs, but they're still left with much higher profits than what they initially started out with. So that's kind of putting things together, okay? Um, let me quickly say two things about, you know, the great thing about writing a paper like this, which Jan and I didn't appreciate when we started it, is that we've gotten tremendous amount of valuable feedback, right? And it's been kind of uh, very interesting the last couple of years. One thing that I want, two things that I want to flag here today, just for, in order for you to access the literature, two things are important. When economists talk about markups, we have in mind price over a marginal cost of production. Okay, that seems kind of obvious, right? But there's been quite a debate about, well, if we put all your uh, other costs that the firm incurs inside of your variable cost measure, we find your markups do not go up as much. And that's like, well, that's kind of obvious. If you put fixed cost in terms of variable cost, you're no longer going to be measuring markups. You're going to be measuring profits. And so what this figure on the left does is, if you take some of these measures that are out there in the literature, which essentially are adding all these other cost factors, which accounts call SG&A, selling and general and administrative expenditures, back into all your variable cost of production, you're going to get essentially the profit rate. And you can show this with very simple algebra. So we should really distinguish between the effects on markups and the effects on market power and profits, right? Because we really should care about the profit uh, rate, 
But in order to understand how the profit rate went up, we need to understand how markups have evolved. Because that's going to tell us whether this has, is coming from you know, fixed cost, globalization, maybe there's an antitrust issue, or whatever it is that you're worried about. So there's a clear distinction between markups and market power. And the, say, the second takeaway, which is crucial, is the aggregation. Okay? Some commentators, especially at Jackson Hall, have said, well, the Lucre ACOT, if you take their red figure, this implies extraordinary high profit rates for the economy. This can be right. But that's because they failed to understand that our results are not true for the average firm in the economy. In fact, the median firm in the economy has flat markups. It's all coming from the top firms in your industry, right? And, you know, this is just a violation of Jensen's inequality, which means that the sum of a ratio is not equal to the ratio of the two sums when you have a di distribution that's just getting much more uh, dispersed over time, right? So two takeaways, let's not confuse markups with market power, okay? In particular, if there's a variable fixed cost distinction. And second, if we wanna make aggregate implication statements, one has to really do the aggregation from the ground up, from the micro data. Because you can easily show that when I'm given aggregate data, and I would come here today, I would rep report much lower aggregate markup increases. And that is as I should, because the aggregates are masking this heterogeneity that I've just described to you, okay? So these are two very important takeaways from the US studies. Um, now, we can move now to the rest of the world. I mean, of course, after Jan and I wrote this email, uh, this paper, we got emails from you know, every country in the world almost, how about us? And we said, well, we don't know. We only had the US data. So after a while, we started looking for data that had at least the ability to do something similar with all the possible caveats and problems, right? And we have people on the panel here who can testify uh, that this is a very difficult task, right? Um, so we did what we could do in short amount of time, which we grabbed this world scope data, which is essentially CompuSet for the world. So every country will give you their listed companies and their uh, associated SIC filings. So essentially what they give to their shareholders. Okay, so we redo the same analysis, and this is for the rest of the world. Uh, sorry, this is for the entire world. What's sort of interesting here, when you look at CompuSet for the US, the nagging thought you have is, what do you do with these guys who make a lot of sales abroad? So, you know, you might have like Google in there or Amazon, but you're also gonna have manufacturing firms and they might actually make a lot of money overseas. So are these really the markups of firms in the US? No, they're the markups of firms incorporated in America, which doesn't mean the markups in the territory of the United States, which for competition policy is clearly a big deal. The great thing about working with the world is that the world is a market, so you don't have this issue of leakage, okay? Right, of course, what's inside global is mostly a lot of American companies, but also others. So let me show you some regions that we brought. Um, here we broke it down by continents. North America is essentially the US with Canada, right? That's where we have most of the data. We have South America, Asia, Oceania, Africa. The data on Africa is just very, very sparse. This spike here is just orange coming in at some point with massive profits and they just, you know, skyrockets the, the, the margins, right? So we are very transparent about all these issues. What's sort of interesting here, there's been a debate about what's going on in Europe. And early on, Thomas Philippon was one of the first to actually make a headway on this by saying, you know what, in the US it's been going up, in Europe not so much. And he was right for the time period he was essentially studying which was started 2003, 2010 at most. So we actually find that same flattening, flattening out, but the same rise that we find in America has been uh, taking place for the European listed companies. South America, as a Chilean banker described it to me, has always been uh, distorted, but constantly so. So you see these high margins, but just no real clear change. Then you see Asia, Oceania, for the Australians in the room here, there's like a big policy question out there. There's been a long concern of sort of anti-competitive cartelization of the Australian economy, which you know, may be a good factor to study there. Asia is interesting. I brought uh, one extra slide for China, okay? By the way, I'm flagging this here because Jan and I were very proud at some point that we are gonna make all of this data available and the way we're gonna do this 
is, I don't know, by visualizing it with a map. We thought at the time it was a good idea to do it. So there's going to be a website at some point available where, so, where you can just download industry country year pairs where you can download this type of data. We still need to figure out with the data provider on how much we can disclose. Uh, and the more we can do, the better. Okay, so let me bring something from China, okay? So this is the markup from China from 1980 to 2014. The reason that I'm bringing China, it's a nice segue into what I think are, or my current thinking is about the potential drivers, okay? This figure here, which doesn't look all that pretty, the reason it doesn't look pretty, this comes from uh, uh, the census data in China. So this has all private manufacturing Chinese companies from 95 to 2014, which is essentially this period here. First of all, it tells us that these two data sets seem to agree with each other, but China is like an outlier in, if you look at the big countries in the world, right? Essentially, it's a state-mandated program of becoming the manufacturing warehouse in the world by just marginal cost pricing, okay? And the way you can see this here is that the margins are going down, okay? So how can it be that the margins in China are going down, where I say the U.S. manufacturing markups have been trending up, okay? So putting these two things together um, leads me to at least my current thinking, which is the, the mere process of globalization interacted with technology has, in, for firms, effectively enlarged the market size, right? You can sell much easily across the world, but an often forgotten equally important mechanism is we can now also equally easily source our inputs from anywhere in the world at much, much lower cost. So the mere fact that we can produce for a tenth of production cost while doing the design at home, and even if we pass on some of these cost savings, but not all of them, you would actually see variable markups increasing although that there may be an associated fixed cost of doing this, you know, setting up this outsourcing infrastructure, which is, you know, not a small thing to do. The reason that I come to this conclusion is that uh, in some uh, work with Penny Goldberg, who is now the chief economist at the World Bank, but, you know, at Yale, we actually have done a case like this in India, where we looked at the massive trade reforms, and we had this counterintuitive result that post-trade liberalization, markups went up which at first seems to go against any kind of logic any trade economist or free trader has, is like, open up your country, it's good for you. Yes, it's good for you, but who is you? You is the country in total, but who is getting the gains? What we saw, the short-run implications for the trade reforms in India, which was a massive slashing of tariffs, was essentially that firms, a car company, can now buy steel for a tenth of the price. Because yes, the steel tariff went down, which is more competition for steel producers, but for firms using steel as an input, it means their costs went down, right? And so in the short run, you get marginal cost reductions, but if there is an incomplete pass-through of these cost shocks, you will actually be left with higher margins. That's sort of the effect we found for India, and we've been finding this in other regions of the world. So if you put all of these things together with sort of you know, the period that we saw in 1980 to 2014, and it's that pervasive across a whole block of countries in the world, it's hard to believe that this is just antitrust. It's hard to believe that just some leniency on mergers and some leniency, and that doesn't mean that there's an active role to be played right now because we're left with this situation. It's kind of hard to think that it's been poor antitrust enforcement over four decades, right? It seems to be much more the nexus of globalization with technology and the increasing dispersion of who is grabbing the rents of these innovations, right? And I think it's important to recognize that there's not one silver bullet here so that policymakers think they can just hit a switch and the problem goes away. It's much more complicated. And there might be different realities in different story in different industries. And so I think the time is kind of ripe to start doing much more careful analysis sector by sector and taking on board some of the things we found here. So to conclude, um, we see large secular changes in firm performance and it's true for firms at the top. The top firms are doing something different. They're moving in new technologies, right? This can deliver welfare increases by the mere fact of better products, better services, uh, long run benefits, but at the same time, we should worry about 
the situation we're left with, which is this sort of declining entry, declining innovation, uh, and the kind of you know multinational uh, shopping that goes on across input markets. So we just you know have to do much more research to re really know what's going on. And I think, <laughs> obviously coming from me, this is this, this, you would expect this, but I think what's going to be clear here is to have evidence-based discussions and not about what one believes there to be happening and therefore what should happen, right? And this debate is, is really important. It goes well beyond, you know, what we were talking about here. It's about people's lives and the wages they get and the worker uh, environments that they're in. Um, and so I think it's going to be important that we remain critical of the findings, uh, but that we interpret them as correctly as we possibly can. So I'll leave it here. I think it was an excellent presentation to set the scheme in order to move uh, to further to the discussion on uh, uh, whether we have a by the other panelists agreement or disagreements on the facts and on the implications for productivity and growth. Um, I Personally, what I found quite striking is uh, the very sharp increase of markups in Europe uh, after 2010. And also in the map you saw that uh, the markups increased particularly in South Europe, uh, Italy, Greece. Uh, so uh, <coughs> let's uh, leave the discussion and the questions for the discussion section. Uh, I will turn now to Chiara. I will follow alphabet alphabetical order on um, the panel uh, speakers. Um, uh, Chiara, what are your views from your research at OECD? Do you agree with Jan? And what are the implications for productivity, growth, and equality? So, um let me let me first start saying that you know we find very similar results as as Jan said the interesting thing is that we do find similar results using different data in particular and I think that's the big ad addition from our work we don't look only to listed companies we look to sort of a large set of private companies we have not got yet to the stage of all private companies in the countries we look at and we look at about 25 countries across the OECD. Uh, so we find, I think, two points that, that Jan stressed in terms of increasing markups. Uh, one is exactly what Jan said. I mean, we have heterogeneous firms, and in previous research, we look at productivity, labor productivity, multifactor productivity, uh, or revenue-based uh, multifactor productivity. We found this increase in divergence in productivity, and we found that this also was reflected in increased divergence in between firm wage inequality. When we look at uh, markups, exactly uh, like Jan showed uh, for the US, is we see a big increase in dispersion as well in markups, with the biggest increase in markup happening only at the top. And let me perhaps uh, get to this. So the increase, if you have here, you know, the bottom decile is what you know you have here is really flat, and then we start seeing the fifth decile, sort of the median companies, and the top decile in, in our uh, set of com countries and firms that we limit to be uh, more than 20 employees, we see a very similar increase to what Jan said. So again, I completely agree that there has been an increase in markup, but only at the top. What I think is the new addition, and, and it links very nicely uh, to what Jan was discussing, or changes in production technology as well, is the fact that when we look at uh, you know, differences across <coughs> sectors, and that one was one of your questions, I think, we really see uh, two things. One, we always saw that there has been a bigger uh, markup, if you want, in digital intensive sectors. This was true at the beginning of 2000. But when we look at the latest year, sort of the 2013-2014 periods, we really see that this big gap in markup, so higher markup in digital intensive sector is much higher today than yesterday. Does this mean that we see uh, you know, a problem with market power. Here is where I'm much more nuanced, and, and I agree with, with Jan that there is not a straight relationship between high markup and problem markup. This might be a reflection of the higher use of fixed costs, of intangible assets, and so on. And that's something that we are still trying to disentangle. Now, given these doubts about, you know, markups equal mar market power, sort of high markups equal market power, what we tried to do is something a bit different. And, and so the idea was, uh, for our group at the OECD, is to say, okay, let's look beyond markups. And that's really, I think, another big contribution that, that we made, is to say, okay, we cannot really say uh, 
you know, high markup, high market power because of this, for example, one of the many, you know, criticism that one can make uh, to this approach that Jan described is this increase in fixed cost. Uh, but, you know, there might be others, you know, you're looking at listed companies, not all the private companies, et cetera, et cetera. So what we do is we take a different approach, if you want, and we reinforce the evidence on markup with evidence coming from other aspects of the competitive dynamics in, in countries. So we look at increasing concentration, and this is a paper that is coming out hopefully next week. Uh, we look also at entry rates, and in particular the decline in entry rates, and then we also have started a new work looking at the increase in M&A activities, because again, these might have implication uh, in the longer run on you know, innovation and, and the quality of innovation. So let me start just with showing you some evidence. We look at industry concentration. This is, I think, an area where there is still a huge lack of evidence beyond uh, the US, and there is also a bit of debate on, on whether this has increased or not. What we do find is basically in, in the two regions we look at, Europe and North America, using this Orbis database that covers uh, you know, a lot of private uh, companies, an increase in three out of four industries when you look at two digit in each of these regions, Europe or North America. And a uh, second thing that we find is the increase is happening in both regions, I mean, much more, uh, much more in the sort of North America, US and Canada than, than in Europe. What it is interesting uh, as well is that this uh, increase, contrary to the increase in markup, which was mainly happening in services, is happening both in manufacturing and services, and is not linked to the digital intensity of the industry. So, uh, you know, that's, again, a picture that is complementary, but does not fully align with the evidence of markup. So, you know, concentration has gone up no matter the, the digital intensity, which we were very surprised about. But I mean, we're still investigating the reason. The second uh, big evidence, and that's very much in line with the evidence of markup and, and this uh, pattern of being uh, particularly driven by digital sector, is the decline in entry rates. This has been documented mainly in the US. Uh, we do uh, look across about 18 countries here. And what we do find is that there has been a decline in entry rate, in particular in, in digital intensive sectors. And this is also accompanied by a decline in job reallocation rates. At the same time, what we find is that exit rates have really been flat. So, you know, you see a decline in business dynamics more from the entry side than from the exit side, which again might be suggestive that, you know, competition is not working as well as we wanted also on the exit margin. The final bit of the puzzle here for us was to look at m and The reason why we wanted to look at this is that there have been, you know, if you read sort of anecdotal evidence, you know, there is a big increase in mega deals. There was also a big talk about, you know, increase in buying of, of digital companies. And in fact, this is what we find. We find a large increase in mega deals. Uh, we find also a big increase, especially in the latest years after 2010, of, uh, you know, software, uh, sort of digital intensive, like, let's call them uh, target firms, uh, sort of data processing, software publishing, and, and so on. Now, uh, you know, what are the implications? Uh, and I think the implication of these really depend on the drivers. So, you know, is this all driven by technological changes? Is this driven by globalization, or is there something else going on, sort of a competition problem? I mean, fr from our studies at the moment, we're much more, uh, as Jan also sort of suggested, it's like we're much more focusing on technological changes and globalization. That said, our analysis does suggest that this cannot explain everything. So there is more work that needs to be done. And, you know, depending on whether you think it's good uh, increase in markup or good increase in, in, in concentration or not, then this would lead to more or less innovation. So if it's good reallocation going to the most productive firms, this might lead to, you know, low inflation in the future, uh, higher innovation, so on. At the same time, if we do believe that startups uh, have a role to play in the whole innovation arena, and in particular in bringing out to the market radical innovation, then you know, the decline in entry rate plus this very big increase in mergers and acquisition might lead us to worry that in the long run we might see a decline in, in also you know, radical innovation, innovation can, that can really change the paradigm of, of uh, what we're seeing uh, today as, as innovation. 
And similarly, you know, this issue of, of MA, which we are trying to explore uh, today, you know, this, can this imply more or less diffusion? And here we are finding you know, two uh, opposite effects. On the one hand, we find that you know, MA seems to be a tool for non digital firms to actually acquire the technology that they don't have and the talent that they don't have. So we really see, uh, you know, when, when we look at the uh, sort of technologies in the patent that are acquired by the, the, the by the firms, we see a big diffusion of digital technologies across the whole economy, which might be good in the long run for aggregate productivity growth. So this is something that, again, you know, we need to, to do more exploration to, to give a firm answer, but I would say the glass is half full in, in, this, uh, in this respect. And then, you know, again, what we find is this increase in inequality, which we have found across uh, different countries, which is very much linked with this increase in superstar firms and this increase in uh, productivity dispersion. One thing that uh, we haven't looked at yet, but I think is a very interesting uh, political economy question is whether these superstar firms are becoming too big to fail, which clear implication uh, for governments and the, you know, policies such as state aid and so on, but also you know, the incentives for these firms uh, to lobby, which might be becoming bigger and bigger. So you know, I leave it at that. Thank you very much, uh, Chiara, for uh, commenting on estimates. Um, basically, you agree with against estimates, yeah. but you build on that that you uh, bring this uh, this uh, distinction between digital sectors, non-digital sectors, but also referring uh, to some of your other interesting projects related to mergers, entry, and so on. So, based on what I heard, Fabian, should I worry? Do we have a problem? Well, uh, let me come to that, but uh, firstly, it's a pleasure to uh, be here uh, today. Uh, it's a topic uh, I must say that I really like uh, personally. Uh, in uh, my past university life, I used to be uh, more of a macroeconomist, uh, but in my uh, professional life since then, I've been more uh, practicing on the micro uh, side of things, uh, industrial organization, uh, including all my career at, at Google, where I deal a lot with uh, competition policy. Uh, and one thing I like about this topic is it brings uh, both of these perspectives together very uh, insightfully. Um, so this is a topic that also asks fundamental uh, policy questions. Uh, I want to uh, do two things with you today. Uh, number one, uh, just share some comments about the specific uh, estimates that uh, Jan and uh, colleagues produced. Uh, and secondly, move to the uh, equally crucial uh, issue of interpretation. Uh, what can we uh, make of them? And uh, then address your question also, Georgios. Uh, so without further ado, let's uh, dive into the data. Uh, so the first thing uh, that, uh, first reflection that comes to mind uh, for me when I uh, look at uh, the work Jan and colleagues did is that it's uh, truly a Herculean effort, right? Uh, they're uh, measuring uh, firm level markups for uh, all US incorporated firms and now uh, expanding to uh, beyond the US uh, and over a period of basically up to 70 years. So it's the sort of thing that uh, you must not be faint of heart uh, to do. Uh, it reminds me of what uh, Chris Patton, the former governor of Hong Kong, said of landing uh, in the uh, old Hong Kong airport, uh, that it's something that drives atheists to prayer. <laughs> so uh, it's an ambitious task. Uh, and uh, I would say if my life uh, depended uh, on it, uh, I would uh, uh, want to make sure that uh, these uh, production functions that have been estimated are uh, stable, uh, uh, well specified uh, throughout the period, because it's a very long period, lots of industries uh, to look at. Uh, I would also uh, look at data stability, uh, thinking about what's happened in Silicon Valley over the last uh, decades. Massive change, right? Uh, the labor uh, share, the, uh, if you think about that, the, the wage has shifted from the wage bill to uh, equity, for example. Uh, we're using more outsourcing, uh, we're using uh, more subcontracting. So massive changes in the way production uh, actually happens. Uh, and uh, looking at uh, data over uh, decades in these databases, I, I just wonder, have these things been treated uh, consistently uh, over time? Which is, well, an uh, easy question to pause, difficult uh, one to answer, I'll, I'll admit. Um, another uh, thought I had uh, when reviewing these estimates uh, relates to the issue of international uh, trade, which uh, Jan uh, touched uh, upon. Uh, and certainly in, in the paper I uh, reviewed, you were uh, focused on looking at U.S. firms. Uh, you were weighing your markups uh, based on the market shares of uh, U.S. firms, but we're, of course, living in an open economy. So uh, 
we have imports, we have Chinese firms coming in, and I wonder if you took a more holistic view of what is happening in terms of sales uh, in the US, you took account of the Chinese firms, uh, to the extent where uh, markup distribution is different uh, from that of US firms, which uh, now based on your latest estimates, it seems to be radically the case. Uh, maybe when you average over all of that, uh, the results from the lens of the US uh, look then uh, potentially quite different. So uh, that's an area where I would love to see uh, further work. But let me park comments on the estimates themselves. Let me uh, take them as, as given, certainly in the broad picture. Markups have increased over since 1980s, uh, something you observe across the economy, et cetera. Let me just bank that and, and discuss how we uh, interpret it, if that's indeed the, the position. Uh, and here interpretation really uh, is key. Because when you think about increasing markups, the natural tendency bias uh, is to think that, well, uh, prices have increased, or a lot of people go to that explanation. Uh, but as Jan uh, noted, uh, markups uh, can equally well increase if prices are dropping, it's, but only marginal uh, costs are dropping faster, which suddenly sounds like a totally uh, different, more innocuous uh, situation. But, but let me raise maybe uh, another uh, interpretation issue that I haven't seen uh, mentioned uh, anywhere, uh, and which is uh, the case of vertical integration. So consolidation across uh, the supply chain. So when you consolidate across the supply chain, upstream, downstream, whatever it is, uh, you, what happens, and this is insights from industrial organization, we know that uh, profits go up, prices go down because you're pairing complementary um, stages of production, uh, but also markups uh, go up, of course, because you're now comparing an output price with uh, a further upstream uh, markup uh, price. And so I'm just wondering whether that's an interesting dimension to explore, whether your data correlates with uh, different patterns of vertical integration in the economy, which, uh, again, would lend a different uh, interpretation to the uh, aggregate findings. And yes, uh, interpretation uh, matters here. And uh, as we know, uh, all of us are guilty of it. We have priors uh, and uh, theories in search of data, uh, and certainly, uh, we have people who believe that antitrust enforcement has slackened in the past few uh, decades. Uh, and so a lot of people were super keen on, on your paper, I must say, because aha, here's something that shows me that market power has increased and my hobby horse that the competition authorities are not uh, doing their job properly is, is validated. Um, but in that respect, at least, I certainly agree with uh, your takeaway. Uh, I don't see this um, theory borne out by the data. Uh, because uh, it's a finding uh, that uh, is made across the entire economy, so it's not just tech or a particular sector. And it's a finding that you make uh, globally, uh, your paper and uh, other related papers. Uh, so it's uh, very difficult to, I think, sustain uh, a policy-driven uh, explanation that all of this would have happened in parallel everywhere, uh, and much more easy to think about it as being driven by uh, technology which leads me to a little bit where I am, uh, how I interpret things, certainly in the state of the debate right now. Um, I quite like uh, the uh, author Van Rien and et al. Uh, type of uh, explanation uh, about superstar firms, uh, where essentially uh, they say that uh, consumption has shifted to uh, the uh, upper end of a productivity distribution, so the more productive firms are uh, doing uh, better these days can think of a number uh, of explanations for it. Uh, maybe product market competition has increased, globalization, or maybe technology has uh, made certain things possible for consumers. They are more savvy, they can search, compare prices, and uh, end up with the deals of the more productive firms. Uh, either way, they are doing better, and it's driven by a reallocation process, and that's also something, Jan, you have uh, emphasized entirely consistently. <laughs> Um, and, uh, in fact, the estimates in your U.S. paper are for uh, two-thirds uh, of a change uh, driven by this reallocation effect, not the within-firm uh, effect, but uh, consumer shifting to the top of the uh, distribution. Uh, and my read uh, on that sort of finding is that it's entirely uh, consistent with the competitive uh, process. Technology diffusion is something that takes time, that needs management practices to be uh, adapted. Uh, and so, yes, not instantaneous, but consumers can shift in a competitive economy much more uh, readily. Uh, and so I see that as 
competition at work, and paradoxically, yes, it leads markups to increase and leads people to worry about market power, but two-thirds of this increase is because of consumer shifting. So for me, that is actually normal and, uh, and good, uh, or I, at least I see no wor the reason to, to worry here. Uh, and so I'll uh, wrap up at uh, this stage. Uh, in essence, uh, very interested in a few uh, research outgrowths from where uh, Jan and colleagues have taken uh, the literature, be interested in this question of international trade. Uh, I'm also at the moment seeing this as consistent with competition rather than uh, anything else. Uh, but uh, to conclude, I, the variable for me uh, to watch more than any others uh, is technology diffusion. Uh, because uh, looking forward to the next decade, uh, we have the lowest labor growth ever uh, expected in the United States. The situation is similarly challenged in uh, other major uh, economies, so we're going to need uh, productivity to come and uh, give us a boost. And so I would be uh, most interested to see how uh, technology now diffuses across uh, the economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fabian. Uh, from what I understand from your explanation, uh, you are not in disagreement with Chiara's fighting about digital, non digital sectors. Mm -hmm. You agree with the tr trends, uh, observer? Well, I, I don't have, a, I, I can speak about the digital sector better than I can speak about the, the non digital sector. But uh, uh, yes, trend wise, the data is the data. Let me also uh, bring an empirical uh, evidence in the discussion about vertical integration. Um, some uh, a year ago, the European Commission ran, uh, published a commerce sector inquiry, and one of the main findings is that manufacturers, the upstream firms, uh, have more tendency to be uh, present in the downstream market. So we have more vertically degraded uh, incentives uh, to uh, have. Um, Jeff, how do you see uh, the discussion so far? We had some divergence view of, uh, on the reasons. We had uh, empirical trends on the table. Uh, and of course, uh, crucial policy questions. How we move forward. Thanks. Um, I, I, uh, I very much enjoyed uh, this research. I, I love research that is uh, innovative, provocative, and uh, raises more questions than it answers. And I think this qualifies in all areas. And, and I'm going to get to some of those questions that it hasn't answered. And this is for no flaw in the research itself. It's because it is provocative enough that it raises a lot of interesting questions that can be then followed up in, uh, in future research. I remember one of, my, one of my professors used to say to me, every paper you write should contain the question for the next paper that you're going to write at the end. And, and I think he, ha he, had a, he had a very good point there. I'm, I'm going to. Um, rely on, 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 uh, on Jan's uh, research, but also some recent research that has been done by some of my colleagues at the IMF, uh, D.S. Lee and, and Tamberlichen, who have also done similar research. They did a recent uh, study of 73 countries and came up with very similar results. And I think it's, it, it does give us a certain sense of um, reassurance when we're in an innovative research area that different researchers are coming at this from slightly different angles and finding similar results. So I, I think I'm pretty comfortable with that part of it. I'm not an expert in the methodology, so I won't get into critiquing that. But if I could, what I'd like to do is very briefly summarize how I see the stylized facts that come out of these different research. And then I'll move to uh, some of this discussion that Jan, Jan started on why this is happening. And then, and then I'd like to spend a little time on what the policy implications of this might be. So the stylized facts as I see them are this. We see this raise in markups across industries. It's not just in the tech industries, although there might be some additional concentration in tech industries. We see it as being very widespread across advanced economies. But when we widen the universe to emerging markets and developing countries, the, the results are a bit more mixed in that category. And one of the possible reasons, as Jan was hinting at, was it's possible that some of these countries have such distorted competitive frameworks to begin with that markups were already high and there's a different process that's going on in, in, in those countries. We've also seen uh, that, that this, this uh, increase in markups has started in the 1980s, paused briefly before the global economic downturn, and then has re, uh, reignited uh, since then. And it seems pretty clear uh, from the research that this is by and large the result of some superstar firms, not a more generalized increase in margins across the industries, uh, across firms in, in, in any given industry. 
And, and then we get to this point about the, the relationship between this and market power. And here, I, I, I read the data as being somewhat mixed. That is to say, we've seen a huge, we've had seen a relatively robust increase in concentration in the US, and it's correlated with the rise of markups. We've seen a much weaker concentration increase in Europe, but we still see the same increase in market power. So the relationship may be there, but it's not a straightforward uh, relationship. So, so going from these, these stylized facts, as I've tried to summarize them, there are a number of explanations of why this could be happening, and you've heard a lot of these already mentioned, but I'm going to kind of put them out and say why I don't think a single explanation is fully satisfying, and it may actually be some combination of, of different explanations. The, the first one, of course, is that it's an increase of monopoly power from higher concentration. Well, I've already said that might be true for the US, but it certainly doesn't seem to be true universally across countries. So maybe part of the explanation, but certainly not all of the explanation. The second one, which was mentioned in passing, was this idea that there's been a relaxation of antitrust legislation and enforcement, and that could be driving it. Here again, I think the answer could be there's a pretty clear case that there has been some relaxation of antitrust in the US. I don't see the same re relaxation in Europe, so that can't really explain the European results in the same way it could explain uh, the American results. A third possible explanation, and this is one I think that has, has a lot of uh, power behind it, and that is sort of tech-related productivity shocks, right? So these are, these are that some firms are, are, are increasing their productivity in a very substantial way due to some technological shock or, and or reducing their costs, right? And we're, we're seeing that result, and I would agree, it's not because of the prices, it's because of the costs, either from the productivity side or from the cost side, that is, that's leading to those higher markups. Um, but the question that is interesting to ask yourself there is, but then why has there been so little diffusion of these positive technological shocks to other firms in each industry. One would think that looking at a period from 1980 to now, a period of 40 years, you would see more diffusion of these technological innovations. And it's an interesting question why that, that may not be the case. A, a, related, uh, a related point to that, sort of I would call that 3B, uh, is that um, we've simply moved into a world where increasing economies of scale are more widespread. And that's the fixed cost explanation that Jan was referring to. That is to say it, it, that we're in a world where in, in producing in many, many different industries, fixed costs are higher, and therefore you have more of a nat natural monopoly situation. And you could also add that in some technologically oriented industries, marginal cost comes close to zero. So you have high fixed costs, virtually zero marginal costs, you're ending up with a natural monopoly scenario, and that can drive uh, uh, margins, certainly. Uh, this could also be a result of networking effects. So, you know, if I'm using Google to, as my search engine, because everybody else is using Google and that makes it better, then there's a natural pro process that generates that concentration of, of work in, in, a, in a particular firm. Um, <laughs> Another explanation, a fourth possible explanation, is that, that across industries, firms have been doing a better job than they did in the past at product differentiation. So I'm just better able to tell, convince consumers that my product is different, and i.e. better, and they're willing to pay more for it. So you might think this might be an explanation of sort of, you know, Apple versus Samsung, that if Apple is just great at convincing people that Apple products are just different, it's not a generic uh, uh, smartphone, then they can exploit that by charging a higher markup. Um, that, that, again, probably works on tech industries, but it's hard to see how that works in the steel industry. If I'm able to convince people that my steel or my wheat is better in some co qualitative way than that gives me more market power, doesn't really seem to answer that, that particular part of the, of, the, of the stylized facts that we have seen. Um, Finally, let me throw out a possible explanation, which I, I was even debating whether to include, but I'll throw it out here, and, and, and you can feel free to slap it down because I know it's got serious flaws. And that is, if we are in a world increasingly where the superstar firms are inhabiting essentially a different, uh, a different uh, global market, and, and let me explain what I mean, a different global market for capital, then you can see a situation where some of these other explanations which drive up markets, say in the US, could then filter through to other places. So let me, let me play this out. Suppose we're in a world where the top firms have a globalized capital market. And for whatever reason, it could be productivity shocks, it could be antitrust enforcement, the, in the US margins are rising. Then the capital is going to move out of Europe into the US, chasing those higher markups, 
until the markets are then equalized. So you could theoretically see a situation where firms in Europe have not experienced the same degree of concentration or relaxation of antitrust, but capital has flowed out until your returns are equalized, and, and that's what's going on. Now, the problem with that argument, and I realize that it's a very serious problem, is why isn't that happening within industries in a single country? This is essentially relying on the argument that there's cross-border movement of capital at the superstar level is much freer than movement within industries to equalize the, the margins within a single industry. And I, I'm not sure how we can, how we can, uh, we can reconcile that. Um, now, finally, let me just spend a couple of, uh, of minutes on, on what the possible implications of this uh, might be. Um, depending upon the cause, of course, the implication could be benign or it could be quite negative. Among some of the negative implications that, that our IMF research has shown, for example, is that up to a certain a point, increase in markups is, co is correlated with higher rates of investment. But after a certain market, a markup level, we start to see a negative correlation. That is to see higher markups are associated with lower investment. So rather than getting the market power as a, as a tool for innovation, we're getting actually market power as a, as, a, as a negative force on innovation and investment. So it depends upon which side of that inverted U curve you might be on, whether on a macroeconomic level it's a good idea or it's not a good idea to, to, to sort of sit by and let this, let this sort of happen. Uh, um, so you might end up in a situation where you have suboptimal investment as a result of being too far on the inverted U curve in, ter in terms of the markups. It's already been mentioned that we're undoubtedly going to be in a world where we have lower labor market share, labor income shares. And then that has implications for employment, it has implications for workers' welfare, et cetera. And finally, this idea that we have super, superstar firms that are increasingly differentiated from the bulk of firms raises the question about deadweight loss, essentially. You have a, a, a higher and higher share of firms with a higher and higher gap between the production possibilities frontier and where these other firms are producing. So there's, there's a potential loss of growth, economic growth that's there. Now, finally, let me say, well, what does this mean? What, what should the policy implications of this be? Um, and and, and I, I, before I say what I think they, they, might want to, they might be, and I'm gonna raise more questions than answers, I want to, to highlight uh, Two questions that a professor of mine in applied microeconomics told me in graduate school many years ago. He said, you always have to ask two questions before proposing a policy response. The first one is WTMF, and I don't mean WTF, I mean WTMF. What is the, what's the market failure? WTMF. If there is no market failure, then there shouldn't necessarily be a solution. So if in fact it's a natural process of productivity innovation, there's no market failure, there probably should be no policy response, right? But if there is a market failure, then you have to go to question two. And question two is, what's the cost-benefit analysis behind a possible policy intervention? So even if there is a market failure, it's also possible that the policy intervention to try to fix that market fail failure will do more harm than good. And so you have to kind of think about that side of it as well. Having said that, if you've got these problems of potential underinvestment, potential lower, lower labor incomes, and potential lower economic growth, you could think about distributional policies to deal with labor. You could think of stimulatory policies for research and development or for investment to deal with that underinvestment problem. Um, or you could think about um, the possibility of some taxation policies on, on, on monopoly rents if, if, in fact, that's what you're seeing. Uh, and finally, you might want to think about what is it that, that the public sector can do to encourage greater diffusion of these, te of these technological improvements than what we've seen so, so far. So, Please take this all with a grain of salt. I'm not recommending any of these. I'm just saying, if this is your, if this is your problem, then th these are possible solutions that might be out there. But before you move to the possible solutions, you have to figure out if there is a market failure and if the solution is actually going to be more effective than, than the cost. And let me conclude with one final remark about this policy implications. Uh, my casual sense, from as somebody who's spent my career working all over the world, is that we may actually be in a, in a situation where high markups in some countries are due to overregulation, and high markups in some other countries might be due to underregulation. So there's no, not necessarily a single policy answer there. When I saw those Latin American numbers out there, and having spent much of my career working in Latin America, it was perfectly understandable. There's a lot of monopoly power. There's a lot of collusion going on. There's a lot of uh, overregulation in some economies going on. 
But if you look at the results for the US, you could make an argument that it's actually been too, too lax in terms of things like antitrust enforcement. So I think really we're going to end up in a situation where we have multiple causal factors which might require different policy reactions in different countries. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. I think uh, you touched uh, many uh, issues at your time and that can motivate uh, discussion. One of those issues, Ryan Hilda, was about uh, investment, innovation, competition, the relationship. What are the implications of the empirical trends on this direction? What do you think? Yeah. So first of all, I, I also like the other panel members like to say they really like this uh, work of uh, Jan and Jan um, because it, indeed it brings micro evidence base uh, to, to, to the policy discussions on very important issues, and particularly the fact that you can really do this at, at a large uh, scale here. Um, so that's important because that will allow us to really also identify what drives these markups uh, here, trying to identify better which firm characteristics, which sector characteristics, country, time uh, here. But on top of that, what's also very important is that uh, it allows also to look at the distribution uh, of these markups uh, here, and that we can really go beyond just averaging, but really also looking at what's the impact of the whole distribution for uh, implications uh, here. The relocation from low markup to high markup is very important uh, here. And whether the rise in markups is not just <coughs> an average one, but where in which parts of the distribution it will be important here. So definitely, I'm a, I'm a big fan of this research here, um, particularly also because it allows a lot more further research uh, to deal with uh, trying to understand better the drivers um, as well as the implications, as has been said. <laughs> Uh, in terms of that, I think there's still quite a lot of, of research that uh, that needs to be done and can be done with this type of data. Uh, if we look at the sources then, uh, like was already mentioned, so we have, is it technological change, is it globalization, is it competition policy, and all of these things of course will matter in terms of what the implications are of, of the trends that we are uh, seeing here. The angle I would like to take here today is, is uh, like uh, George was saying, is, is my own area, which is innovation uh, economics, and to which extent is innovation a source? Of, um, of, of these uh, markups and, and market power here, and also what are the implications of these trends that we are seeing for the innovation uh, dynamics uh, itself here, and try to see uh, and bring a bit um, in the discussion uh, what we know actually from the innovation literature that could actually help to uh, for this further research uh, agenda here. So in terms of um, the role of innovation and intangibles, uh, also Jan mentions that quite uh, often in his analysis too as, as part of, of, of the story that could be going on uh, here. So the firms that are in this right tail of the distribution of markups, so the higher markups and the ones that have stronger increases in markups, are these the more efficient firms? Are these the more innovative, the higher productivity firms here. If these firms uh, with a higher markup are also the ones that are more efficient in terms of, of, of uh, innovation, then that need not be bad uh, from, from policy implications uh, here. We know that they need the incentives to invest in innovation in the first place here, so what we're seeing then is, is, is really a well-functioning of markets here. And also the reallocation from, uh, from um, less to more innovative firms here, if that's really reflecting the reallocation from low to, to high uh, margins here, um, then that's just a, me a measure of well competitive functioning uh, markets uh, here. But of course, we also know from the literature there's lots of nonlinearity uh, too here, so that indeed um, markup uh, and, and market power could also distort innovation uh, here, uh, keep innovation uh, down here. So it's not so obvious that there is this direct linear relationship between market power and uh, innovation. So what I would like to, to see is to which extent we can actually use Jan's, um, Jan's uh, models um, and his productivity function approach to learn more about how, what, what the relationship is between R&D innovation and markups and what the uh, implications are we can draw for that. So first of all, what matters is quite a lot the aggregation of sectors that you're looking at. That matters because all the firms in the same sector are assumed to have the same production function uh, here. So a lot of discussion, competition policy, I'm trying to identify relevant markets uh, here. So here you use a rather aggregate level of sectors, uh, like the, the NACE2 here. And so for instance, the finding that most of, of, of the increases in, 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 um, uh, in market power or sorry, in, in, in markups is within sectors can actually be due to the fact that we have very aggregate sectors here and a lot of shifts are actually still occurring from declining 
subsectors to uh, to increasing uh, sectors here, new digital sectors uh, here. So I was wondering to which extent if you would go to a much more disaggregated level, much more um, uh, level of markets that we typically use uh, in competition policy, whether you would still have this within uh, sector dominance here, or whether there still could be quite a lot of, of shifts from uh, low tech sectors to, to the more uh, growth sectors uh, here. Um, but of course, lots of things will indeed be happening within sectors. Uh, but then again, the sector definition really matters because in, in this approach, you assume that all firms will have the same production function. So they only differ in terms of the use of inputs and the scale at which they're operating. But of course, frontier innovating firms typically operate differently, not just only because they're using different scales uh, here, but also completely different technologies, ways of combining uh, inputs uh, here. So it's not just a difference in terms of how much inputs you're using and what type of inputs, but also the whole production function could actually uh, be different here. And then a different markup could be actually a reflection just of these differences of innovation and not necessarily of any, any market power here. So I'm wondering to which extent you can actually so disentangle and identify uh, differences in markups from differences in efficiency and differences uh, in, in market power here. And then the reallocation to higher markup firms within sectors, if these are the more, more efficient, innovative firms, then that's just a witness of good competition here rather than as, as of, of bad competition here. So how far can we actually push this approach to learn more about um, uh, innovation as a driver, a good or a bad driver of, uh, of um, uh, efficiencies uh, here? Um, what also matters in this approach very much is whether your inputs are fixed or variable uh, here. Um, and in that respect, R&D, you typically assume that's a fixed cost uh, here, but more than three-thirds of all R&D expenditures are in the, are in the form of wages uh, for high-skilled uh, labor here. So are these wages included in the variable costs uh, here, or are these assumed to be fixed labor costs uh, here? And how easy is, is, the, is this approach uh, adoptable to uh, all the different parts of fixed of, or, or variable costs, depending on the, the nature of these um, <coughs> wage costs uh, as well uh, here? Um, so in general, I, I'm, I'm thinking to which extent we can use that approach uh, to learn more about R&D. And we know that only very few firms will actually be R&D active and particularly will be at the frontier. So we actually have three different types of firms, those that don't do any R&D here, those that would do R&D but would be simply adopting uh, technologies here, and then the ones that are really at the frontier. And for me, these three different types of firms also use, can use completely different production functions uh, here. Uh, and not just use different levels of, and what impact would that have if you use a different production function uh, on, on uh, being able to identify the sources of, of, uh, of um, markups uh, here. Um, and then finally, in terms of, of the dynamics, I think it's very important. So this persistency in markups, what you find, I think that's really very important for the, for the implications uh, of this. Um, and so if, if there is persistency in terms of the ones that are more efficient to more innovation, are also these the ones that will be persistently continuing their, uh, their uh, markups uh, here? Or is there also enough turbulence here among who these leading firms will actually be? will have a very big impact on what the implications uh, are. And then if we look again at the innovation literature, there basically are, are two phases uh, here. So on the one hand, the, the literature finds a strong bad dependency. Uh, so the ones that are innovation leaders have a very high likelihood that they will continue that innovation leadership here because they can build on their strengths, on their experience here. And it holds particularly for incremental innovations, which is most of the innovations that we see here. Nevertheless, once in a while, you have these dramatic, drastic game changers here, which typically come from outside, which will be very important for the innovation progress uh, here. Um, but where there is indeed also quite a lot of turbulence among who these leading firms uh, would be here. So it matters also not just to identify persistency, but also whether it's the same players or whether there is this turbulence here to know actually uh, what the uh, impact uh, would be. So we looked at this also within Bruegel uh, directly by looking at R&D, who are the R&D spenders and how concentrated this is and how persistent <coughs> this is. And we do indeed find overall that uh, it's very highly concentrated in few leading 
leading firms and the result of persistency among who these leading firms are, but that depending on the sector or where you are, there is turbulence among who these leading firms actually would be. And particularly in the digital technologies here, there is, um, there is persistency, but there is also way more turbulence among who these leading firms are. So concentration in any sector, but the turbulence way will actually be different uh, according to the different uh, sectors uh, here. here. Um, and that's why it would also be nice to see uh, the extent to which in, in this approach here we could also look at that turbulence uh, too here, because it will have very important implications on persistency and its implications uh, here. But again, would require really looking at a much more disaggregate level of sectors here to pick up uh, where these differences and trends uh, would actually um, would actually play out uh, here. So overall, I really like this approach, uh, particularly because, like you mentioned, it really introduces a lot of scope for next steps of uh, research uh, here that will be even more evidence-based um, support for our discussions. Thank you very much, Rehilda. I think uh, many food for thought on innovation markups. Uh, I'm sure that uh, there are some reactions, but uh, as we are move uh, ahead of time, what I suggest is to merge these reactions with some questions from the audience. Uh, so uh, we can collect two, three questions, and then we go back to the panelists uh, to react on what the other panelists uh, uh, said and on the questions. Two questions here in the front. Please identify yourself before asking. Hi, I'm uh, Scott Marcus. I'm a senior fellow here. Uh, I was wondering the degree to which firm, <coughs> the, degree to <coughs> there we go. The, the degree to which firm size might correlate with some of these factors. Uh, Europe has, I think, a relatively high mix of SMEs. Uh, historically, when we've looked at things like uh, research intensity, investments uh, as a fraction of GDP, a consistent concern was that the larger, the best firms tended to invest pretty well, but SMEs were very slow to take up ICTs. I was wondering if that might explain some of the Europe versus North America differences and, uh, and uh, might in some ways correlate and have some explanatory power here. Thank you. Another question there. Hi, my name is Carlos Maraval and I work at the European Commission. Um, two issues. One is, uh, from a macro perspective, your analysis is pretty depressing, right? Because the markups go up together with the productivity slowdown. So it looks like things are going bad. But at a micro level, I would like to know for a firm that creates a new product, how much are consumers willing to pay for that? If I understand well the markup, if you go backwards to the 1980s looking to have good that is not available today, the markup is zero. But maybe we should be a bit, I mean, saying that the price somebody would be willing to pay is infinite is probably too much, but maybe we should be a bit generous in saying that, you know, saying that it's zero just because it doesn't exist is somewhat a bit too harsh, I don't know. If I understand well, that's how you go backwards when you aggregate, right? If a good doesn't exist, markup is zero. But if a good doesn't exist and then it's created, somebody was willing to pay for it. So I would like to understand that better. Uh, any other question? Yes. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So this. this uh, Right. So the difference between the EU and the US, uh, is that due to uh, differences in sector composition or is that due to within sector uh, differences? Jan, the floor is yours. Added to my long list. Um, thank you. I mean, I essentially have an answer to all of your questions, but we don't have time to do that. So I'm just going <laughs> to I, 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 I'm just gonna pick and choose some. I think what's very important uh, with the methodology, so, so I think and I have brought this forward, is that the main issue with uh, concentration ratios and all the competition policy discussions is it requires a market definition. And people are paid big bucks to fight over, no, it's this big or it's this big. And the bigger your product market, the less you're worried about market power. The beauty of this approach is the only thing it requires is to group firms and put them into bins where you think technology is comparable, right? And that is something you can be very robust with. In fact, all the questions that this is what I was, I wasn't joking that I have answers, is when we've re-estimated everything by giving each firm a different technology parameter, which you can do with these cost share approaches, the same results apply. And if you look back at this intuition that I gave you, the mark is essentially sales over a variable input expenditure, and it's scaled by a number. And whether that number is the same for these 10 firms in the sector, or each firm has a different number, the numbers can just mathematically not do all that much heavy lifting. The heavy lifting is coming from the ability 
of sales to grow faster than the variable input expenditure. So that's really key. And the reason that markups are much more understandable by business people, because it's actually a number they care about. Productivity is something made up by economists in our models. Right? Zvi Grilich has told us it's just a measure of our ignorance. If I see two firms, one spends a dollar on input, the other one spends $10 on the input, but one generates more sales than the other, we, don't, we cannot explain it, so we're just gonna say, well, it must be that one firm is more productive than the other. Now, if you're both producing a homogeneous good, like a bar of steel, and the same identical inputs, we can compare these firms. But how do I compare productivity in the technical efficiency sense if firms are making different products and the quality is different, right? So as soon as you kind of leave this kind of nice uh, environment where firms produce identical products, this productivity measure is hard to interpret, right? It's essentially dollars of revenue given a bundle of dollars of inputs, right? Which actually gets much more closer to profitability, right? So implications for productivity for the firms is quite hard because I'm not sure how you even compare them. In the aggregate, you can. This is why macroeconomists do aggregation and have price indices. And one intuition I can give you is I'm not so pessimistic in terms of productivity growth. I think there's been massive productivity growth. It's just that the numbers are just not giving it to us the way that we're actually measuring productivity, right? In fact, you can show mathematically if margins go up, so the wedge of price to marginal cost increase, you will actually get an underestimate of the productivity growth simply because the way that we are measuring aggregate productivity growth in the data, it has to do with the incomplete pass-through prices or wages are just not informative about productivity growth. You would look at the US data, wages are flat, you would conclude that productivity growth has been flat. But that's not true simply because of the productivity growth is in the cost, and costs are masked by increasing in markups. So I think that's a very important implication that one has to keep in mind, that if this is all true, these facts, that we have to really seriously rethink how we do productivity growth uh, measurement and, and how we draw inference. Um, the thing is, it's not zero. If a product wasn't there, you just can't take the delta. You cannot take the difference. This is the whole problem of new goods in the economy. How do you value the good that wasn't there before, right? And I think the SMEs is, is, an, is something that um, you know, people have, have looked at before. These are essentially frictions in growth of firms. Again, on concentration, I think the reason that Europe has sort of ambiguous things on concentration and not so on markups is what's the product market in the EU? Is Belgium the product market? Is it the, is it the Benelux? Is it Belgium and France together? Is there a border? And what about imports, right? Whereas the US is much more of a contained market size. Of course, there's import and exports, but it's not as big of a leakage as measuring the market share of InBev in Europe. How do you do this? Where who knows how much they're selling inside the EU and where they're producing and these multinationals are scattered with all their affiliates. So the measurement on concentration is just gonna be much more difficult. And let's remember the revolution in 1980 in industrial organization that made it very clear that I can have an increase in concentration but an increase in competition or I can have a decrease in concentration and a decrease in competition, right? These results are ambiguous. So one has to be very careful interpreting C4 and market share HHI numbers to draw policy conclusions. They're informative descriptors about a market, but they cannot be definitive about identifying whether competition has gone up or down. Yeah, so let me leave the rest of the time for the Thank other you, student. Uh, Chiara, uh, your major uh, takeaway from this discussion. So, I mean, I think that, uh, to me, the main takeaway is that we can learn a lot. I think we don't have a definite answer on what's driving this. Uh, I think we all agree that technology has a big role to play. Uh, I think we still need to understand a lot of what's the implication for competition, what, what are the implications for innovation, and really is this markup, is increasing markup good or bad? I think there is still a lot to learn. I mean, if we believe the Google view, it's good. If you know, we believe some other views, it's not so good. So, uh, I think you know, I, I still believe that taking all this evidence together with you know concentration, the work of uh, Philippon or the work uh, on superstar firm, mm -hmm. our own work on, on Frontier, really helps. Sort of, I think we all agree that there has been a, a big increase in awareness <coughs> of the distribution, and this is a strong implication for inequality. And I think we all agree on that. That would be my sort of stable point, I know that this is sort of happening in the U.S. and abroad, so. Thank you, Kara. Fabian? 
Uh, so, uh, gosh, so much to uh, take away. We should really just lock the door and spend a few days to uh, work uh, all of this out. Fine by me. Uh, but uh, which would be fun. Uh, just some random uh, observations. Uh, we've spoken a lot about uh, concentration increasing uh, as a stylized fact. Uh, just a note that that's uh, concentration measures um, at a national level, uh, typically in the U.S., uh, there are recent papers by, I think it's Rossi Hansberg and a couple of Fed uh, economists that show actually that if you look at it at a, at a local level, uh, which is more uh, relevant in a lot of markets, uh, concentration has gone down in the U.S. And the way to reconcile the two findings is that essentially national firms have been taking more uh, of a business, but actually local competition has uh, gone up, which is something we don't uh, always uh, think about. Um, uh, one plea that I would put uh, to all of us is, uh, of course, tech is a popular uh, sector uh, to look at uh, these days, but uh, sharing is caring. Uh, we are here looking at uh, the whole uh, of the economy, and it's uh, often misleading to look at it uh, just from the uh, angle of tech. So uh, we should remember it's a macro analysis here. Uh, and uh, we mentioned, for example, increases in the profit uh, rate uh, in the economy. Uh, actually, when you look at it sector by sector, in the US certainly, uh, the uh, profits, the share of profits going to the information sector has indeed increased over the last 20 years, but by less than you would think. And actually, the, the big thing that stood out for me is that the finance and insurance sector has shot up, which was particularly, uh, well, striking post bailouts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's just remember to take a broad view of these things. Um, and maybe a final note on Chiara's uh, presentation about declining entry rates. I know that's also been uh, a stylized fact. Uh, it surprises me from my, my very narrow uh, Silicon Valley view where uh, if I throw a stone, I hit an artificial intelligence or machine learning startup. So I'm just wondering how I can reconcile my micro experience with uh, these micro facts. Uh, but on that, uh, thank you very much. It's a really fascinating debate. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, you referred in your talk on combined effects uh, that play a role here. Uh, so, does this mean that we need a multi-dimensional approach in this issue? What is your major takeaway? Correct, correct. Yeah, I, I mean, I, the point I was trying to make on the multi-dimensional is that I think my personal instinct on this is that the causality is probably multi-factor. And if it's multi-factor, there's not a simple answer to what to do about it and whether it's good or bad. And I think that's the thing that I'm concerned about. If I were to point to the, the sort of the single factor that, that does concern me the most, and, and Jan kind of alluded to this on the, on the productivity measurement side, for me, the, the, the thing that concerns me the most about these results as a macroeconomist is that gap between the production possibility frontier firms and the rest of the firms. That could be part of the explanation why at a macro level we're seeing a slump in productivity growth. Not because the superstar firms are not as productive. In fact, they could be even increasing their pace of, of, of innovation compared to the others. It's the lack of diffusion. I mean, that's, that's what would be the most concerning issue for me of the ones that we've flagged so far. Thank you. That is clear. And I Hilda, you are an optimistic person by nature, <laughs> so please close the panel with some optimistic remarks. Ah, that's easy. <laughs> so I think we as economists, we usually always agree that everything is very complex and multidimensional uh, here. But uh, as an optimist, uh, indeed, I do think that we can make progress on this and uh, try to understand better the different dimensions and how they interact. And particularly in this age of, of big data here, and, and this is actually also what this work really nicely illustrates here, that if we have access to large larger data sets, which much more heterogeneity, we'll be able to learn more here. Um, and I do think that artificial intelligence and deep learning will not be enough, that we also need uh, economists to work with these big data uh, here to improve here. But it's a combination that will help us to learn uh, more here. So we're on the right track. Thank you. Hopefully we'll have access to these data. Jobs. We still have jobs, today. that's why. <laughs> so uh, I invite all of you to all me thank the speakers for being with us today.